Welcome back to Everything is a Primary Source, the podcast version of going to a Tim Burton-themed restaurant in Manhattan and chatting with an actor portraying Jack Skellington about the nightmare before Christmas. All right, that is very specific to this episode, as you are about to listen to me and Nick Vincent Barbera, whom I met at Beetle House NYC a few years ago, as he was performing as the Pumpkin King, analyze the 1993 animated masterpiece. This is what the show is all about, dissecting media to determine how it acts as a reflection of the era and society from which it came. But before we walk into Halloween Town, here's some thoughts about two real Halloween towns. My family and I visited Sleepy Hollow, New York for the second time in three years this past weekend, and just as before, we enjoyed what the Westchester County Village displays this time of year when Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow comes to life in several different ways throughout town. But we live in New Hampshire, so another major Halloween haunt, Salem, Massachusetts, is much closer in a place we've visited several times and at different points of the year. I visited Salem for the first time one summer when I was about eight years old, and my main memories from that trip include being freaked out by the mannequins, the witch museum, and having our family's ice cream order total come to $6.66 across the street after our tour. Subsequent visits have given me the opportunity to explore what Salem has to offer besides things tethered to witches and other October staples like vampires and ghosts. The city offers a variety of historic sites, especially connected to its rich nautical history, as well as literature, namely Nathaniel Hawthorne. What's interesting is that Salem's claim to being a Halloween capital comes from a real series of events in 1690s, the Salem Witch Trials, while Sleepy Hollow is the location written about in fiction. The Headless Horseman is a character in a story within a story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which was published in 1820. But visiting both of these places, you wouldn't necessarily recognize the differences as they both present their spooky figures similarly. Salem's police force, which some guy impersonates in the 1993 Hocus Pocus, and fire department famously has a witch on a broomstick crossing a full moon as their seal. Sleepy Hollow's first responders, similarly, show their main attraction, the Headless Horseman, brandishing a jack-o'-lantern on their vehicles and uniforms. A long history of heraldry explains this for both towns, but the Sleepy Hollow one makes a little more sense since their character actually did come from there, both in folklore and in literature. Meanwhile, witches, especially the variety that wear all black and ride brooms around, are not real. It did not actually exist in 1690s New England, or anywhere else for that matter. Much of why and how these two Halloween towns have developed the way they have can be figured out through treating the towns themselves as primary sources. The Salem we know today is a product of four different time periods. The late 17th century, when the Puritans from Salem Village, now Danvers, accused their fellow residents of working with the devil. The mid-19th century, when the bustling commercial-based Salem town became a city. The early 20th century, when as city leaders began referring to it as Witch City, and the 1950s when playwright Arthur Miller wrote The Crucible, himself using primary source documents to make it as true to history as possible. It was in the last two time periods where we get the competing narratives of Salem and why tourists descend on the city, especially in October. It doesn't hurt that Salem is just north of, and actually part of, the major metropolitan area of Boston. Before the 1920s, Salem was recognized for pretty much everything else besides the witch trials. But with the rise of automobile driving, day trippers, locales across the country wanted to draw tourists to them, and so looking into features that differentiate one place from the other became the go-to to promote each destination. What's more distinct and unique to advertise than with witches, especially if the true story is watered down and fictionalized to get people there? Visiting nearby Danvers a few years ago, which is a much less populated, more suburban place in Salem, 
and where the bulk of the Salem quote-unquote witches came from, I came across a historic marker from 1933. It refers to the Salem witch trials and those who started it as mischief makers. Just a few blocks away stands a memorial dedicated to the victims of the panic that was designed and dedicated in the 1990s. It is quite the moving tribute to the poor people who were killed over superstition and mass hysteria. This transition in perspective is owed entirely to Arthur Miller's play, itself an intentional document of Red Scare era fears and persecution. Without updating and humanizing the real events of 1690s Massachusetts, we wouldn't have the serious side of Salem's witch-related tourism. That's not to say that silliness has been erased altogether. As I mentioned, Hocus Pocus came out the same year as the memorial in Danvers, and by no means do the Sanderson sisters have any basis in reality. But theirs and countless other Halloween symbols are very much represented all over town. And their comedy saga repaints Salem's history and honestly its actual appearance. Both the original and last year's sequel try to pass off Salem as Small Town USA, with a little witch footnote in its history that only the super knowledgeable are aware of. The Hocus Pocus movies are almost alternate universe stories, relying on both the existence of actual witches and Arthur Miller not writing a play about the community. Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is a great early example of American pop culture. His first name gives away that the author himself is a product of the Revolutionary Era, and the style and subjects of his writing are documents of early 19th century America, more specifically the Middle States region of the developing North. The story has been retold many times over, including a famous Disney cartoon, various picture books, an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark, and of course, the 1999 Tim Burton film. More recently, Sleepy Hollow is the name of a science fiction police drama, just like Hocus Pocus, reworks the real town's appearance and vibe to be far more urban rather than significantly suburban. Two of the most important time periods for Sleepy Hollow's identity are chronicled in the story about Ichabod Crane and his being chased out of town by the Headless Horseman, or Brom Bones more accurately, in my opinion anyway. The early Dutch colonial period and the Revolutionary War make up those two time periods. Terrytown, of which Sleepy Hollow is a village, does have at least one quote-unquote witch as part of their history, but her story is linked to the Revolutionary War along with the fictional Hessian horseman. Also, British Major John Andre and his apprehension and execution as a spy, the first part of that saga taking place in Sleepy Hollow, is a real person and true story that is used by Washington Irving to tell his other story. All of this is represented in most of the Halloween celebrations of the community, but spread out differently than what one will see in Salem. Aside from a few attractions, Sleepy Hollow seems to have devoted itself to present its Halloweenness from a historical perspective rather than a fictional one, which, as I began with, is interesting considering it's actually the other way around than from Salem's actual events that act as the foundation for what it conveys in a rather fictional way. For most of the community's existence, it has been part of Terrytown, a community known by anyone who's ever crossed the Tappan Zee Bridge because it's the first exit after crossing on the eastbound side. But in 1996, Sleepy Hollow received its own designation, and since then the name has appeared on signs along the many parkways and highways leading to it. This has to be part of the same pop culture movement that transformed Salem into how it appears today. As Nick and I discuss in today's episode, home video, cable TV, movies, well, mass media in general, had become such a force in American society. And combined with more ways to get from one place to another, and with New York City being right down the road from Sleepy Hollow, basing tourism on recognizable media titles only makes sense for the modern era. As we get into the breakdown of 1993's The Nightmare Before Christmas, we should consider that it is just one of several indicators of how our society's relationship with and the basis for Halloween has altered over its history. 
These two towns, Salem and Sleepy Hollow, both help document the same development by way of what they've contributed to the overall climate of spooky fall fun. Thank you, Eric, for those insightful comments. Always a pleasure. I'd like to take this opportunity to plug my website, everythinghistory.com. That's the source of info about this podcast, as well as my consulting and coaching offerings. I'll be presenting the Everything is a Primary Source Method and Mindset a week from today in Concord, New Hampshire, followed by a day of podcast karaoke at the NHCSS Conference. That's New Hampshire Council for the Social Studies. Then later this fall, I'll be doing the same thing over two days in Nashville, during the National Council for the Social Studies Annual Conference. You can get in on the action by attending either of these conferences or by simply going to everythinghistory.com. That's everything-history.com. And now, on to the big show. Today marks 30 years since Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas was released in theaters. What a perfect day for it, October 13th. But maybe a better day would be Thanksgiving Day. After all, as a film that begins on November 1st and culminates with Christmas Day, Thanksgiving is the perfect balance. Anyhow, here's Nick Barbera and I and our breakdown. The uh, list of people have appeared most often. This is Nick Barbera, and uh, welcome back to the show. It seems like every season I have you uh, to talk about something chilling, spooky, creepy, Welcome back. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, this has been, I don't know how many times at this point, but I've been on here for quite a few. Yeah, well, it, it's funny because um, the first time I ever met you, it was as your alter ego, Jack Skellington. Um, and so it kind of like springboarded from there, this, uh, you know, friendship. And I, I think we met maybe twice in Beetle House, and the second time was like a week before COVID. <laughs> it's like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was like early March 2020, and I have pictures still of like my whole family and you, and I think uh, the owner or something hanging outside, you know, taking our pictures and stuff. And yeah, and it's like it was like the last known picture before the world turned upside down. It was it was like the it was such a surreal thing after that. That's but, right. Um, yeah. And ever since then, our world has just been like online, you know, just talking and, and through cameras and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. um, you were saying because of what you do at Beetle House and just off uh, before I hit record, things are getting pretty busy in October. Um, you guys having to take reservations weeks in advance, probably, right? Absolutely. Uh, we've been looking at the reservations through the rest of the month ahead already, and it's a roller coaster of the different crowds of people to a point where we take a look at the total number of covers and, you know, it's like, can we even fit this many? Um, but they, they find a way. Yeah. Which and, is the great um, news, obviously, but well, and, and it's even better news because it's the one place really in the country and maybe in the world that uh, it's Halloween all year round. Um, so it's not like everywhere else where once it hits November 1st, it's really weird doing Halloween type stuff. Whereas there it's like, it's perfectly acceptable. So if you can't get in this month, it's not the end of the world. If you, you know, show up in November 5th or something like that. And right. uh, it's always a great time there. So um, today's topic is the nightmare before Christmas, which uh, the movie came out 30 years ago. Well, I'm going to be releasing this on the 13th, which we have a Friday the 13th in October this year. Um, so that's exciting. And mm-hmm. um, the movie came out in on October 13th. But in 1993, that was a Wednesday, um, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of unique because I, I didn't I, I guess I didn't recall that movies were released that early back in the nineties, I thought that was a trend of like the two thousands and 2010s when, you know, a big action movie came out or any kind of movie after a while. And they're like midnight showing on Wednesday, you know, to start the weekend off. But I guess they did that back in the, (laughs) um, back in 93. But, um, before we launch into it, obviously you have a deep relationship with this movie because you've had to study it 
Um, when you got the job at Beetle House, did you ask to be Jack Skellington? Not really. Um, I really landed the job through a couple of my friends who I was working with at Sleepy Hollow at the time for their haunted house. They went over for their interview with Beetle House. And they knew that I was a huge fan of Nightmare Before Christmas ever since I was a kid. And that growing up, being an actor in like plays and stuff, I wanted to play Jack Skellington in something. I didn't really care what or where. I just wanted to do it. And, you know, so I've worked on the voice and the mannerisms of my own time. Like just for fun. So basically during their interview, my name came up in conversation and they said, oh, okay, we haven't really had, like, like they've had Jack Skellington before, technically, like someone else was in makeup and slicked her hair back, and it looked really cool, but that didn't really last too long. So they said, oh, can he come in for an interview? And they said, well, ask him. So they told me about it, and I was like, absolutely. So I coordinated. The next day, I had my own interview. And I travel all the way over there specifically for this opportunity. And then I had the interview and I felt as if I was horribly un underprepared, if at all, because all I had working off of me was a photo of myself in high school with face makeup as Jack. And, you know, it, it, you know, I didn't really have anything entirely too professional, like what I assumed they were looking for. So I had the interview and, uh, you know, it went well. But then after the end of it, it kind of felt like one of those uh, don't call us, we'll call you kind of scenarios where I thought to myself, well, I guess I didn't get it, but at least they know I exist. But then later on, on August 25th of that year. I believe it was 2018, they they contacted me and said, hey, we're going to be having a big celebration because it's Tim Burton's birthday. And, you know, we want to celebrate it in a big way. Are you available? I said, is that even a question? I would be so down. So from that day on, I just kind of toy, uh, kept on working away at Beetle House. So, so it wasn't really... Um, it wasn't really anything that uh, was like, you know, necessarily, oh, we have a Jack Skellington already, but you'd be a good backup. It was more like they didn't really have one. And so they were, you know, that was on the list of characters that they were looking for. And I just so happened to fill the spot. Kind of fit it perfectly. And I love about Jack Skellington is that, and honestly, all the characters in the movie is that, when you first meet them, you feel like they have a significant backstory, that there is quite a bit more to the character than what we're first encountering. And of course, there's always like, you know, on YouTube and stuff, they point out in Beetlejuice, you get to see Jack Skellington's face on top of his head when he's you know, rising out of the model of the town. And, that's right. Yeah, that's the first spotting of him. Like, it's just a skull face. It's really not necessarily him. It's just kind of right, like yeah. a, a very a Burton-esque uh, skeleton. Uh -huh. But when you meet him in the movie, you know, with the, the outstanding opening music and everything, this is Halloween. And, and then you see him, it, it's like, there's definitely more, there was a lot of like preparation for this character and everybody else in Halloween town. And we're just kind of like getting our, our meeting tool. Like, so when you, um, prepared as jack did you kind of feel that way too there like you were saying like you're like i'm not really quite like am i doing this right because like i feel like this this character needs to <laughs> to a lot of you know he he deserves justice you know he needs to you know yeah. live up to the jack skellington name mm -hmm. well that's a it's a kind of conversation that we have at work sometimes still where i mean it doesn't matter uh which character we are uh but what does matter is that we meet up to some of the guests' expectations, if not all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. By that, I mean, you know, in the case of Jack, you know, uh, my rules are very strict about how I portray him there because people go in there expecting to meet him the way that they know mm -hmm. him and the way that they remember him best. And just to, 
carry a conversation with him in a way that only he could. So what I mean by that is, you know, really taking my own time to explore on my own his likes, his dislikes, what I think he would enjoy, what I think he wouldn't enjoy. Um, you know, people are still going to ask him about the Christmas thing. So I have to yeah. <laughs> follow, follow up with that. You know, how does time yeah. go by after he tried out Christmas back then, you know, and does, um, does that still affect him now as it did then, you know, like that kind of deal. Uh, right. But so there's a little bit more of an actor's character's evolution there, if that makes sense. But, you know, in terms of um, the way that people remember Jack best, you know, I still throw in a lot of references from the movie in there, obviously. And, uh, you know, but still leaving some room for new things to explore. Uh, in a way, it really is kind of like what Jack would want. You know, that yeah. long that longing for something new in there while also uh, keeping true with the tradition, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it does. I was actually my son and I were putting up our Jack Skellington in our yard today, uh, you know, decorating for Halloween. And we, we have like this big pole. I tried to use it as a tetherball pole, but that didn't work out. <laughs> um, it's actually meant to be like a it's like a temporary. uh a uh, pillar for like a garage that's falling down or something. And I just, you know, had it um, because the, the shed it was holding up did fall down. Um, yeah. So I just tried to use it for tether ball. And now it's just in the yard and I'm like, all right, something's going on here. So I, I put Jack up there and, you know, he, we're going to have all sorts of different kinds of pumpkins underneath him. Cause he's the pumpkin King. So he's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, lording over his, his realm. And yeah. my son said, he's like, Jack is, you know, he's kind of scary. He's kind of mean. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't think he's actually mean at all. He, he just, um, he's, a, he gets me, he gets mad at Oogie Boogie. You know, Absolutely. that's for sure. He yeah. doesn't like him because he goes too far. Mm -hmm. And I said, I always like characters like Jack Skellington where it's like, he has a menacing look to him. I mean, he, the man has a skull face and, right. you know, he kind of has that spooky, very gothic, you know, way about him, but he's not at all evil. He's not bad. Um, he is actually a, a really good guy, but I love characters that can, because when he gets mad, oh man, it's just like, it's, oh, he yeah, gets bro. very steamed. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I like that. I like that kind of character where it's like, he's on our side, but you know, he still looks pretty bad. You know, he looks yeah. tough and I like guys like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, my son just kind of shrugged and was like, okay, you know, I, as I lectured him about Jack Skellington right, yeah, yeah. as I, you know, put it up there. But um... <laughs> so the way that uh, I, I do things, and you know this being a guest before, is we treat um, in this case, a movie as if it was being entered into a museum as an artifact. So if you've ever been to any museum, uh, particularly history museums, they usually have something on display, you know, artifacts, and then a little card which explains, you know, what conclusions can be drawn from that piece of pottery or, you know, the uh, the dress or, or some kind of, you know, relic that's left there. And that usually comes from somebody dissecting it like we're about to do for this movie. So we have a number mm -hmm. of questions to an answer. You know, there's really no question we have to start with, but I usually do start at the top with the material that it's made from. And um, this is what gets a lot of confusion for people, I think, including myself for the very longest time. It's called mm -hmm. Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. So it's an assumption that Tim Burton had a very heavy hand <laughs> involved right. in the making of this movie but yeah. as it turns out it's more or less he's he came up with the main characters and the story but then just kind of walked away from there yeah. um is that the way you understand it as well absolutely um i think that i personally think that henry Selick should get more credit where it's due because he was the guy who really directed the the film and I believe at the same time, Tim Burton was really working on Batman Returns, so he couldn't really be there 
as often as people believe he was. So, uh, and I think that the 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 fact that it's called Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, I think that was more like a last minute marketing strategy. I don't recall if that's entirely correct, so don't quote me on that. Even though it's on a podcast, but um, I I, not I do. Sure. I feel like I you know I've gone over enough of those different articles and and YouTube videos that people make that that does sound about right. That it's something he wanted to do, but mm -hmm. as you said, he was very busy with Batman Returns. This is almost like you know, so his career really kicked off with. Pee Wee's Big Adventure, but before that it was Frank and Weenie, you know, the short. Mm -hmm. So he's like riding the crest of this wave through the late 80s. And then right after Batman in 89 and Beetlejuice before that, it's, you know, it's like he probably had no idea just how huge and in demand his storytelling was going to be. And so he has this idea for a really, and it's a fantastic idea, you know, the idea of like holiday towns kind of all bunched together in this dimension somewhere and um interacting with each other i mean that's such a cool idea and but then just at the last minute he's like i can't do it all you know so i'm just kind of mm -hmm. i'm gonna put my best people on this i'm gonna you know everything's gonna kind of reflect me and i think that really says right there by the early 1990s just how um involved into our lexicon tim burton had become and that's mm -hmm. actually a really short amount of time, nine years, you know, not even a full decade. He's already gone from nobody, you know, working, some guy working at Disney to then making this huge series of really big movies. What is that? What does that say to you about um, American culture and society in the early 90s? That You know, this guy who'd been making kind of weird movies for a while is now so mainstream that they can slap his name at the end of, at the beginning of a movie and everybody that as a marketing scheme, as a way to get people in the seats. I feel as if like with Tim Burton style, especially you have this guy who had a very distinct style and a sense of vision that was so weird and so strange that not too many people were doing even though it was very rooted in early Hollywood, like German expressionism mm. and things like that. But here's a guy who is in a way kind of fully reviving it in a way that still captures people's attention. Um, but like <laughs> people, I guess, just didn't really know what to do with him other than mm -hmm. just go see these movies and, <laughs> just 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 see how weird they were like if you go back and you listen to critical receptions of most of his films particularly beetlejuice people went to go see it but they thought it was so weird and it didn't make any sense but yeah. it still captured their attention so they still went over to go see it i think the same thing with edward scissorhands and uh yeah peewee's big adventure like those like mm. those films um, and even 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 Batman, you know, the films that did well, but everybody critically was just like, what what do we make of this guy? Right. But somehow I want to keep seeing more. So I have a feeling that by taking his name and putting it in front of the Nightmare Before Christmas, it's right in there with his lexicon. So when people see his name, they're like, oh, my God, we got to go see this new Tim right. Burton movie. Um, same thing kind of happens right now, you know, with. um yeah, the films that he makes now, you know, when you see the name Tim Burton, you think all of that crazy, wacky uh, themes of the dead and uh, things like mm. that. And you're like, oh, I'm very fascinated. I want to go see it. And, and black and white stripes will be involved somehow. You know? Big <laughs> time. Be they they you know, at least make one like, appearance in something yeah. somewhere. Yeah. As, <laughs> as even Sweeney Todd, I was like, oh, my God, they're in Sweeney Todd. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's almost, I, I think maybe in a way they probably had to, they felt they had to put his name attached to it, even though he wasn't super involved, because if people watched that in the theater, they'd be like, wait a minute, this is a Tim Burton ripoff. You know, he'd become so well known yeah. by that point that they'd be like, what's the deal? They're you know, totally taking his style. And then, so maybe as just a safeguard against that, they said, all right, you know, we're just going to put Tim Burton's. So just to clear it off with everybody, this is him. 
kind of right. sanctioning this this movie. And yeah, you know, I was watching. We watched Frank and Weenie last night, the original one, not the 2012 one. Right. Yeah. And just that's almost like a 30 minute preview of the next you know decade of his movies, where just right. imagery wise, um, the way it's like you know the the part towards the end is very like Edward Scissorhands when you know, everybody's chasing him out of town and, you know, it's like, and then he saves a kid and it's like, yeah. everything is, is all kind of, and I, I think you're right. There's a fascination with Tim Burton that people had throughout the eighties and nineties of like, he's giving us pretty standard movies. Each one has at least a few weird parts in it, but overall like if we were to net it all together we're like yeah i guess overall he's making pretty standard fare it's just with a twist it's not it's not so weirdo it's not necessarily like david lynch type stuff you know where you have to sit there and crack a code while you're watching be like oh yeah i know what that means it's like it's pretty straightforward stuff it just has very you know i'll keep using the term burton-esque features throughout it now Mm -hmm. One of the other questions that comes up in this same segment is how is it made? One thing that I oftentimes forget while watching this is this is stop animation. That's why it took so long to make, but it's so well done that you kind of forget that it was using a very traditional style of, and he used lots of stop animation in a lot of his pictures. Um, what What do you think? I mean, we're 93, so that's like right at the, the precipice of when computers started really taking over everything. That's when Jurassic Park came out and, mm-hmm. you know, showed that computers, computer animation could be successful to make realistic stuff. But even they were still using practical stuff, you know, to make Jurassic Park. Um, do you think, had the computers been at that point, would they still have gone with stop animation to get that look? I do firmly think so, because uh, the story of Nightmare Before Christmas, to begin with, back when Tim Burton was working as an animator at Disney, was more or less a good parody of those classic Christmas stories Yeah. before, like Rudolph how the and... Grinch stole Christmas and Rudolph, yeah, where it was like Burton's version of it, despite how, yeah. really, when you get down to it, how twisted it was. So I think they had the idea at the very beginning to have it be stop motion. So that way it's not just that, but also a parody of the old stop motion Christmas specials like Rudolph and, and Santa Claus is coming to town and, and that kind of deal. But there's something about this stop motion that I think is so mesmerizing and is right in between computers and live action where It's so mesmerizing to watch because of how fluid it ends up being anyway, and it still retains that sort of look and feel that a story like Nightmare Before Christmas could fit into. And sometimes I do wonder what it would look like if it was computer generated, like Toy Story or something. And Mm -hmm. as interesting as it would have been and as groundbreaking as it probably would have been technology wise i really don't think it would have struck a chord with people the like how toy story did uniquely in terms of animation if that makes sense like it still would have looked cool and interesting but there's something about stop motion as a medium that first of all is i think is very underrated no matter what time of the uh, decade it was and Mm -hmm. You know, it still kind of is, which is the sad truth of it. Um, But I think it's something about Nightmare Before Christmas carrying on that specific art medium. And again, I really think that it's a good story that only stop motion can tell. Yeah, and it it gives that nice 90s energy to it, too. It's not... Yes, um, big time. I mean, mean, because they they could have done... You know, you're mentioning the these you know the '60s stop animation ones, you know, stop motion mm-hmm. ones like Rudolph and stuff. And I'm sure they had a much lower budget than what he was working with. <laughs> much but, lower. You know, yeah. it's just like <laughs> one camera angle per scene. You know, they just kind of move around the screen a little bit. You know, Gumby type stuff. Um, and the reason why you forget that it's it's stop motion in the '93 movie is because there's so many different angles. They zoom in. They do you know, wide shots, they do close-ups. I mean, it's really, 
all over the place like a regular movie by that point. That's how they were mm-hmm. making all those movies. So you you um, you have the stop motion. You can check that box. And be like, yeah, we we're doing you know homage or my version of those other ones. But it's also the '90s, and this is how we make movies now. You know, right. it's like that dark. You know, everything is dark. Um, and, and that's I think what he had been known for by that point of everything is just dark, dark, dark. You know, it's like the Batman right. movies. Both of them, you know, especially Returns, is just. Like I don't think you see daylight in the entire film. You know the second one. It's just no, like, not. Just, I don't even think once. All, you're right. Yeah, it's like nighttime all the time. Yeah, and you know that's be, became his mo for sure. Uh, and so even though he wasn't involved in this so much, it was um, that how it was made was under his kind of like spirit, like his his the way he would make it for sure. Um, yeah. I I would think that yeah, in, in Toy Story has to be you know has to be digital it doesn't work if it's right anything else because that was that was part of the movie is like look what we can do with computers now mm-hmm. and you know it's like if they had tried to to do it you'd see the guy's hand in the back holding woody and you know that'd be lame right, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah um <laughs> so uh we were talking you know the next question that, that comes up is uh who likely made it or who made it? And, mm-hmm. you know, we started off by talking about Tim Burton. Um, tell me a little bit about the the director of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, what is his sort of what was his status as a director or in filmmaking before this movie? Mm-hmm. Well, Henry Selleck, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know too much about his career before Nightmare Before Christmas. I do know that he was also the guy who made Monkey Bone with Brendan Fraser, and there was already some stop motion in there. And other people know him post Nightmare Before Christmas for making movies like Coraline and even more recently, Wendell and Wild, both really fun stop motion films involving creepy themes. Um, so I don't know terribly much about him before Nightmare Before Christmas, other than I suppose that they found him as the perfect uh, director to help with Nightmare Before Christmas because of his work on Monkey Bone, because mm-hmm. it proved that he can do stop motion, like, you know, very similar to the other masters of stop motion, like Ray Harryhausen and guys like that. So I, I think that. By him having a director, that way I want to say that maybe Tim Burton felt a little more comfortable putting it on his hands so he could be like, all right, this guy knows what he's doing, so I'm going to leave him in charge of directing the picture while I go off and make Batman Returns because this guy knows what – he knows his stuff. Just doing a quick look at his stuff, it doesn't look like he had done much before it, but afterwards that's when the floodgates open because James and Giant Peach – is under his direction, which is yeah, James and the Giant you know. Peach. Yeah, um, I knew I, I knew and, I forgot something. And, I did, and it's but the, all those it's like Shame. so it's almost like he was the next version of Tim Burton, where he had been working. He did like smaller stuff, kind of you know, yeah. and then this was his big break. This is what made his name known and and created a status for him. We can't also forget about Danny Elfman though, because this is a musical. That's right. And so he's heavily involved in what's different. I mean, people make fun of it. So I remember seeing Family Guy one time when I don't really watch Family Guy ever, but I just happened to see uh, one of their parodies of Star Wars. And right. they're like, okay, Danny Elfman's now going to be doing the music. And they have the background that, mm, 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 you know, yeah. it's like, you know, teasing it that way. I'm like, yeah, he does kind of add that, that backbeat, you know, pretty much identical throughout right. all of his movies and sometimes they kind of blend into one but um <laughs> the, the, he goes so well with tim burton like the two of them if you listen to oingo boingo you're like this is not this is not normal music it's not totally insane music it's just not mainstream music and right. tim burton's not a mainstream filmmaker of mm. course they're going to go together really well and um, my understanding is that the two of them kind of had a falling out for a short time because of Nightmare, um, that they were just working so hard on mm-hmm. it, particularly Danny, and they just kind of, 
you know, the way I, I read it is that just two creative minds like theirs can only go so long without clashing <laughs> that they just, right. just stopped talking <laughs> for like a year and a half. And that's why Ed Wood was not um, with Danny Elfman doing the soundtrack for that. Uh, right. But all the other yeah. movies are. And so they go so well together. And, and Nightmare stands out because he sang in it. Um, where you know the voice mm-hmm. for Jack Skellington, Chris Randon from um, Yes, the Princess Princess Bride. That's right. I, yeah. I, oh, I love that movie so much. I love his character so much. Totally mm-hmm. underrated character in the Princess Bride. Um, Absolutely. And his yeah. voice is so perfect for Jack. It's just, you know similar characters, and uh, mm-hmm. and then but Danny Elfman does the singing in it, and which is yeah. not normal for him to to do that for a movie. So it's almost like this is like the the magnum opus for for him. It was like he was not just doing the 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 score; he was actually contributing as a singer to it as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, do you think that the musical component to it does that fall in line with um, the drive to make it like those nineteen sixties stop animation Christmas specials? I don't know if I would say the 1960 Christmas specials, but I wouldn't put it past them if that was also the intention, particularly with what's this, because, you know, since we're talking about those specials, you know, you're in an environment that is celebrating Christmas all the time. You have to have a song that's very whimsical and falls in line with that. Mm. But I feel as if with the musical drive for this film in particular again i have a feeling that it's very much like we're telling this story in our unique way while still i guess keeping in line with some of the musical traditions that disney was doing at this time like with the uh like with the musical songs that they were really driving back into around the time that this movie was being made so i'm mm-hmm. i don't really know about the 60s Christmas special songs per se. Um, I I think that really it does fall more in line with, you know, the, the return to the musical format that Disney was trying to get back to, but uh, mm. that's, that's my outlook. Anyway. Yeah. But, I always just think about the, um, you know, the ones with uh, Bing Crosby, you know, he's like narrating it and, and yes. you know, singing or, yeah. or Burl Ives shows up as Frosty the Snowman and, you know, mm-hmm. they have like their little song and dance numbers. And there's so many of those movies or TV, you know, special things from that era. I lose track of mm-hmm. them sometimes. Like I used to try to watch them in reruns and I'm like, I don't even know what this one is now. Like there's a monster, there's like, <laughs> you know, Martians or something, you know, there's all this crazy right. stuff happening. I'm like, what, uh, you know, why, why not just the, you know, straightforward story. And, uh, Mm-hmm. So they they might have been yeah. riffing on on that a little bit too. Be like, okay, we're we're gonna actually do a good one now, and um, <laughs> one that's pretty you know, remarkably memorable. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, and so you know, the next question that comes up is is why did they make it? And mm-hmm. I I dwell on this maybe a little bit more too much than I should, but you know, I was twelve years old when this movie came came out, so I was like right in that zone of you know i was just about to be a teenager i was you know feeling like a lot of the the movies and stuff were geared right towards me or maybe just a little bit older than me um the 90s as we already stated have like an edge to them they have this kind of darkness to it and i I feel like this movie kind of hits that right in the middle because it's not and, and we may as well talk about the intended audience right now too because it's not really quite uh you know, it's not terrifying movie. It has its, you know, kind of unsettling yeah. images throughout it, but it's not by any means like a horror film. Um, but it's also not mm-hmm. a little kid, you know, G-rated thing. Um, I I right. feel like, you know, this is just my, my opinion. I'll, you know, I'll let you talk and add yours in just a moment. But I feel like they made it because they're like, well, it is the 90s, so we really should be making – something like this, you know, now is the time now is when we can, Disney can actually put this out and not, it's not just some, you know, if it was 10 years earlier, it probably would have been some, uh, you know, smaller studio or something that would throw it together. Like the people that made California raisins. 
Um, but right. what do you yeah. think? Why, why do you think that they made it when they did? I think I think it also has to do with the fact that because we were talking about it earlier, how Tim Burton had a sudden rise in stardom with his films, because after his falling out with Disney, uh, that's when he went on to do Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice, Batman, Edward mm-hmm. Scissorhands. Those were like the main core of his filmography, and he was really cementing his his artistic style in films, and everybody was eating it up. And luckily for Disney. <laughs> they already had a couple of his projects on the wayside, you know, that he really wanted to do. And they still had, um, uh, you know, the, like Frank and Weenie and that odd Hansel and Gretel short he did as well as, um, yeah, that kind of stuff just under their belt anyway. So mm-hmm. they were just like, Hey, Tim, we, we still <laughs> have this poem that you did. If you want to do it with us, <laughs> you're more than welcome to. Uh, to which, you know, I guess they finally reached an agreement. And he was like, yeah. yes, I want to be. Because I, I also understand before he left Disney, he also wanted to adapt his own poem in some way, I think, as a TV special at, at a time. So it really would have that been a parody sound... of the old Christmas specials. Um, yeah. But then at this point, Disney saw what he could do with full length feature films. And so, you know, he was given a lot more room to uh, to play in terms of story and and, uh, in different visual styles and things like that. Do you think this may have been like an olive branch of sorts from Disney to say, all right, you know, we maybe want to work with you now instead of, you know, we've arrived now at the same point you were we weren't there back when you worked for us in the early 80s but you know we're we're there now and here's our our evidence of that is that we want to make this we want to flesh this out into a whole movie i think i think so i think i have a i have a feeling that that was what their intention was because i mean i mean i'm sure we'll get to it eventually you know like what happened with the cultural impact post the movie release. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that Tim Burton and Disney have done uh, collaboratively to effect, to further establish his artistic style, but also really establish the, the impact that this movie in particular left on, on people, um, you know? So I think you know, most likely in the long run, that's what uh, Disney wanted. And in a way, that's kind of what they ended up getting. Now, the next question might be really inconsequential in a long way. It's where was it made? and or what locations were, um, are associated with it. And so, I mean, I guess we could say anywhere. I, I'm sure it was made in a particular sound studio, probably in L.A. or maybe even mm-hmm. England. I, I think I remember hearing somewhere that they did some of it in London or something. Um, mm-hmm. But that, I mean, we it's not going to tell us much about that. But right. the locations associated with it, um, I love – the idea of each holiday having its own town and Me one too, of my yeah. favorite things and this is my crossover into the ideas and behaviors does it convey but one of my favorite things is from the very beginning of the movie when he comes back from halloween on earth and they already are like let's start getting ready for next year like mm-hmm. for some reason that that idea of somebody being so single-minded it's like, you know, in the following year, they do the exact same thing with the Santa Claus when, um, you know, Scott Calvin arrives in the North Pole and there's Bernard ordering all the, right. the elves around. And he's like, are you on a break? <laughs> and it's like, it's Christmas Day. It's like, it's actually Christmas Day. And he's like, we got to get ready for next year. And it's like, right. I love, you know, and in real life, that does kind of happen. Like the Macy's Thanksgiving mm-hmm. Day Parade, which is coming up. 
they start getting ready for the next one like the next day as soon as the i mean not everybody obviously but the the planners for it they really do right. have to spend most of the year thinking about it does every holiday actually have its own town does arbor day have a town <laughs> i have wondered about that if I, if that holiday has its own i like to think that probably arbor day has its own like little village not so much a town yeah but more like a like, like a an amish cozy kind of deal yeah like a park yeah you know that kind of deal. Because they actually do have a Charlie <laughs> Brown movie called that, which I rented one time from, or didn't rent it, I borrowed it from the library. It was, it's right. Arbor Day, Charlie Brown. I'm like, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's honestly, not <laughs> the most exciting it. of, they, they played a tree on his pitcher's mound. I remember that part. Right. At least they, they got to yeah. give that day some love at least, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's an important <laughs> one. Um, so yeah. I, I just, I have to say that I love it. Um, maybe they all get it, but I think that's such a clever storytelling thing where it's just like okay uh you know we we and and the not to keep bringing up the the santa claus movies but they they dabble in that a little bit too in the second santa claus movies or maybe the third right. where all the different uh like the tooth fairy and the easter bunny and all the different you know mascots for the holidays and and mm-hmm. you know characters along with santa claus all meet together and have a conference, you know, from time to time. I, I think it's so mm-hmm. clever. Um, I, I remember yeah. watching the second Santa Claus when that scene happened. And as a little kid, I felt kind of ripped off because you have all these characters and I don't see Jack Skellington anywhere. I, and I still think sometimes how cool would it have been? Like if they negotiated with Tim Burton to just say, Hey, can we use this character in this scene for the holidays? And, <laughs> If he said yes, how they would have done it, especially in live action, he probably would have looked horrifying. <laughs> right. Well, I've seen like the Broadway when they've done the live version and stuff, like the musical acts, it does look kind of mm-hmm. terrifying. It's like, you know, they have a bald cap or a bald guy and he's like, he <laughs> there he looks really scary. But, you know, maybe they, at the very least, because it's also a Disney movie, they probably could have just said, oh, Jack can't be here right now. Or, you know, that would have been fine. You know, probably kind of yeah reference yeah. you know that he, he's busy at the moment you know or like or like, like some kind of like I, uprising <laughs> probably probably like i'm still suffering the, the <laughs> nightmares from that i don't i don't want him here yeah <laughs> uh yeah that's true because santa is the one that gets you know kidnapped by him but all that's like so right and, uh you know we it, it's so like kind of innocent and childlike for jack he's like well i'm just gonna kidnap the guy and i'll take over i i'm really you know fascinated by what he does every year so you know instead of scaring kids i'll go give them presents i love this idea it's so great and uh you know Mm -hmm. what he's doing ultimately is you know completely crazy and and uh terrible for for santa but in his mind he's like hey everyone gets you know you might want to try my job someday santa movie made for do you think who's the intended audience i i know that we briefly touched upon the you know how the movie was rated and also like the time that it came out like during the 90s and things like that and i guess very much like the first initial reception from audiences about it it kind of is a um i think it's a nice middle ground between kids and adults where you get Mm. to have this story that has some i guess pretty like spooky imagery that you can enjoy with halloween but also like this really nice pure feel of christmas that it also goes hand in hand with so i think in terms of what the key audience is i want to say honestly outside of the main disney demographic which was families that's exactly that like families which could mean it's Mm. for anyone that has their attention grabbed by the story and the visual style um i want to say also you know it's right up there with the people who had enjoyed 
Tim Burton's filmography again to begin with, because you have all of this imagery of of really scary stuff, but also like it knows how to let loose and have some fun with it. And I think that once you have that kind of a style patented down, then you have a demographic that's really broad. So I would say, in a short answer, I would say, you know, families who are looking for, again, that happy balance between scary and fun, kind of like how the movie is with finding that balance of Halloween and Christmas. Right. It's, it's like my first Tim Burton movie, you know, it's like a kid's, you know, and, you know, it's an introduction to, you know, cause you know, a young kid in 1983 might, might have been too young for Batman and some of the stuff in there too intense for them, but they can handle, you know, this one. And so it's an introduction to his style of, of filmmaking without being too over the top or scary and without him really being all that involved in it. Um, I also think it has something to do with, you know, this is the age of the home video. So it's not just, you know, it came out perfect time of year. Hocus Pocus came out the same year, but in like the spring for some reason. I don't know who was thinking about that. <laughs> another Dis- does another Disney movie. And and I love it. I think it's, you know, I, I didn't know. I don't even remember it coming out at all back then. Like, I think I remember mm-hmm. seeing a preview for Hocus Pocus when I was a kid, but because it came out in the spring, I was like not thinking Halloween movies. And I didn't actually see it for the first time until probably about well, 15 years ago now. And I loved it. I still love it. I think it's a great movie, mm-hmm. but it's also VHS. That's how it became a cult hit was because of VHS. And I think they probably recognized that, that like, we're going to put it out now in October this thing can actually be watched pretty much all the way through to Christmas in the theater or at home, you know, next year. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great, you know, there's an audience right there too, is the, you know, the rental families or the people who want to give it as a gift for Christmas next year and have it on family viewing night or rent it, um, you know, later on down the road. Oh yeah, this is a great, you know, somebody put it once uh, they are like, well, it's a Thanksgiving movie because it's right in between, Halloween and Christmas. So there you go. There's your Thanksgiving movie. They don't make Thanksgiving movies, mm-hmm. but this one kind of is. And so yeah. I think that that's also, you know, because if they, and I, I hate doing this thing of like always saying like, well, if it was now, if it was now, um, things have changed so much. But just in perspective, they would probably release this on streaming in the modern age. Like, I don't know if it would get a mm-hmm. theater release necessarily for that reason, like perfect timing for. Halloween, and then you can, you know, the themes will lead you right into the holiday season. Um, so they recognize that people were still keeping those patterns in their yearly schedule, and they were making room in their holiday celebrations for movie watching. That that became part of the the ritual of of family time in the '90s was renting movies, ordering pizza, you know, getting cozy in front of your screen and you know, hoping that the person that rented it before you, you know, rewound it. Um, so mm-hmm. you don't turn it on and get the credits as soon as you, <laughs> you're like, ah, oh. um, <laughs> now I know who produced it. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I know we've, you know, I saved this last question for last um, mm-hmm. because I think we already touched <laughs> on qu- quite a bit of it uh, already, but the ideas mm-hmm. and behavior that it conveys. So, um, we haven't really talked about any of the other characters besides Jack and uh, and Santa Claus, right? What what do you think? Um, you know, let's think about some of the other characters too, and and what they sort of represent, or you know, what kind of conflicts come from them, and and what they what other stories might be told throughout. Maybe what kind of lessons or values are are expressed through this. Um, yeah. Besides Jack, who do you consider to like your favorite characters in the movie? Without question, my favorite character in this movie is Sally. Uh, with She's Jack great. being a Jack being a close second, actually. Um, the reason being is because you know this is pretty much she is the voice of reason in the film and yeah. the story. Like she's really 
one of the only couple of characters that sees Jack's vision of Christmas for the land of the living as this idea that could really go sour. You know, the other one being Santa Claus, obviously. <laughs> uh, but, right. you know, with, with Sally, you have that, but you also have the element of this longing that she has for him romantically. Uh, somebody mm-hmm. who overhears him saying that you know, this Halloween thing is getting so boring and I feel so empty because of it. And she understands that completely because she leaves, she lives a very sheltered life. Her father keeps her in the tower of like a good 90% of the time. And she feels as if she's got eyes from her dad watching her all over the place. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, they both kind of have this sense of loneliness in a way where nobody's really listening to them. Um, so because of that, there is a connection there, but it isn't met by Jack and it's longed for by Sally. So when they find, when Sally does finally get to interact with Jack, it almost like paints a different picture because she's trying to explain to this guy that she's longed for that, you know, l- please, like, listen to me. What if this doesn't work? And Jack is really the one that's like, yeah, but what if it did? You know, so he's really <laughs> he's really been dancing around it just because he he thinks that this thing is cool and he thinks it's great, you know, and he wants everybody to be involved. So his heart, if he had one, I guess, is in the right place, really. Mm-hmm. He just wants to do Christmas because he thinks it's different and it's pure. Um, so when he hears a different opinion, he, you know, I hate to say it, but he doesn't want to hear it. He just wants to do it right. anyway. And it breaks Sally's heart because, you know, again, she's back in that place where she's trying to communicate her thoughts and feelings, but it isn't being heard by anybody, not even for the person that she longs for. But when it comes to close and, to the climax yeah, and, where, um, mm-hmm. where it's, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but when it comes close to the, oh, no, um, no to the climax where her vi- her vision of this going wrong is starting to come true she doesn't just sit around she like takes action about it she's like okay i where is this sandy claus where did they take him i'm going to go find him myself and i'm going to help fix mm-hmm. this mess that's going on which i mean she does still end up getting captured by ogie boogie um but you know, to see that even when Jack notices that she tried to help him and to save Christmas as well, like that is the very thing that sparks the actual connection between the two of them now, because Jack realizes, oh, she really did mean what she said. Like she was really yeah. trying to help me out of this mess. I, I don't is... really think anybody else would have done that for me, you know, despite no. their support. You know, because they're fans. You know, she is an actual friend now. And so because of that, that makes her my favorite character in this story. Because really, she is the one that had started the attempt to save Christmas to to begin with. So, right. and she had the drive for it after all this time of being ignored. She's finally like, "All right, enough's enough. I am going to fix this 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 problem." And so, you know, even to the point where even the the other characters recognize that. Like Santa calls her the only person that seems to make any sense, and Jack realizing that he's totally right. <laughs> yeah. Her vo- actual voice is Catherine O'Hara, which a more talented actor and singer you can't find. I mean, she is so funny and so talented with music. And I, you know, you look at the, the cast of this entire movie and it's, it's a who's who of Tim Burton's, you know, all of his films up until that point. And it's like, there's a reason for that, right? It's like, they're all, they all have the right mindset for these kinds of pictures. They, they understand Gothic storytelling. They understand um, how to hit the right moments with comedy and their voice. And I, I realize it's just their voices. They're not actually acting it out themselves, but when I've seen them perform as, you know, anniversaries and stuff like that for 
the Nightmare Before Christmas, like they they still embody the characters as themselves. While we're talking about vocal performances, I mean, we can leave out Ken Page, who is incredible right. as Oogie Boogie. I mean, he we're talking about a guy who already had a wonderful stage presence with a lot of musicals and Broadway shows and things like that. So you get someone like him to play this very over the top evil kind of guy. So evil that Halloween Town actually had to banish him. He's that evil. Uh, And, you know, but still a very theatrical villain, despite how small a screen time he's got. I mean, he also really really did a fantastic job in that movie and it is actually scary you know that you know when you introduce you know when he's first introduced and he's probably the closest that movie gets to actually being you know kids cover their eyes kind of thing and what's he gonna do to santa claus like what's he you know but the Mm -hmm. that's what i would say seamless but you know the seam in his body kind of (laughs) um (laughs) <laughs> I, I, that's his undoing huh um but yeah you know, the i i just i think that 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 whole dynamic takes it up a level right where it makes yeah. it, it and it adds much more of a a conflict to everything else and um it, the, the whole story is just so well done i i've been referring to tim burton all week on instagram as a master storyteller and this is just another one where mm. it's like you know, he is, he's able to take, you know, if out of, if this was in anybody else's hands, it probably would not have come out the same way and no. definitely not have this. Um, we wouldn't be making a big deal of it being 30 years old. You know, right. it, we, we wouldn't be saying anniversary. We'd just be like, yeah, that movie. Oh, it's 30 years old. Okay. You know, it, yeah. it, it, <laughs> it, big deal, you know, but it's like, mm-hmm. let's take the last moment or so of this podcast and you've been touching on a little bit already the cultural impact of this movie is pretty remarkable big time maybe i mean if we're really the condensed version of that is the one word merchandising Mm -hmm. it is so difficult to go out there and not see somebody wearing something with jack skellington's face like a hat a shirt even pants or like socks or a pin and that's just scratching this yeah yeah yeah, that's just scratching the surface. I mean, there's figures, there are like curtains, there's furniture, there is um, recreation of props from the movie in life size. There is like even soap for the bathroom, like all these right. different kinds of merchandise that people will just take no matter what it is because it's Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. Um, And not only that, but one of my favorite things about uh, the post-Nightmare success is in Disneyland, every September through January, they take their Haunted Mansion attraction and they overlay it as a Haunted Mansion holiday. So Jack Skellington and his friends come from Halloween Town and put their, their idea of Christmas into the Haunted Mansion because this is the perfect Christmas for those 999 happy haunts. And right. it's a great way to blend both the Haunted Mansion and Nightmare Before Christmas, these two properties by Disney that are so classic on their own and having them blend in a way that is very seamless and very fun and you know just to see that kind of a tim burton artistic style in three dimensions and to be brought into it in some way i think that that is incredible they do an incredible job every year it it is i was just in disneyland this past summer and I've been to Disney World several times, I'm, I, and this is my first time to Disneyland, and I'm always just so, I just marvel at everything that they do. Like, even even when a ride is closed, they make it special. You know, it's like, <laughs> we're sorry. You know, it's like, yeah. like, somehow, it's like, you're like, oh, wow, like, you really made me, you just made my day by telling me that I can't get on this ride. You know, it's like, they just, they have this <laughs> just like certain quality about that you know everything that disney touches and the merchandising is probably mostly them like when i was putting up the jack skellington you know figurine today i saw on the back of his skull you know disney you know um 
marking on there. And I'm like, yeah, if it wasn't for this powerhouse of Disney, they probably wouldn't have so much merchandise out there. Um, but when people buy it and then they use it, it's definitely, it functions the same way as all merchandise like that does, where they're just displaying right. to each other and they're trying to tell people, this is like, I like this kind of movie. Um, it's not horror. It's basically just kind of attaching themselves mm -hmm. to the creativity of it all. Um, that the immense uh, amount of talent and hard work and um, cleverness that had to go into making this movie 30 years ago, actually 20, you know, 32 years ago, because it took them two years to make it, uh, you know, to, to come to fruition is so much different. I want to say it's more necessary than a drawn cartoon or other movies, you know, live action movies, but it's, it's like saying to the world, I like being scared, but I don't like gore. I like um, right, like Tim Burton type stuff. I, you know, it's just like I, I went to a trunk or treat a couple years ago, you know, which is what rural neighborhoods like or people that don't have neighborhoods do. Um, like we don't really have a neighborhood. So we go mm -hmm. to trunk or treats and this family had a just Tim Burton, everything was their display. And that's, and they had like two little kids with them. And they were like, that's like, we feel comfortable exposing our kids to this kind of scariness. It's, it's not going to give them nightmares or if they do, it'll be kind of like a fun nightmare, you know, and not a, you know, keep, keep them up all night. Yeah. Kind of thing. So, um, it is, yeah, of course, I, I think more than most of his movies, it's, it's the one that, has the farthest reach into our current pop culture. So um, as always, Nick, this has been a lot of fun talking to you. And uh, I hope this once again, isn't the last time we do it. Um, you are very active on TikTok and elsewhere in social media. How can people best watch your videos? Which by the way, a lot of times I watch them because my sound is off on my phone and stuff. And so I don't get to hear it right away. I just start cracking up from the facial expressions of you and your, your uh, fellow actors, but um, where can people <laughs> follow? Where can people follow you? Sure. Yeah. So my TikTok is basically my name. It's Nick Vincent Barbera. Uh, I've been thinking about changing it a couple of times, but nah, I just like, I like it being myself because <laughs> I have a lot on there. Um, so yes, it's Nick Vincent Barbera on TikTok. And yes, I'm also on Instagram, Nick the Ghost Host 999. I'm sure you can guess what my favorite Disney ride is from that. And those are pretty much my main two that I uh, that I am active on. Uh, so yeah, those are the those are the main ones. Yeah, well, I I enjoy them, and I love your characters that you make. Um, there's one that you did this summer where you were like going through like a a tunnel or something as the pirate character. And um, you guys are like, <laughs> and he sits so like, sorry about that camera guy. Or, you know, <laughs> I, cause it's all improvised, <laughs> right? Like you, you, it's, it's so much fun seeing you do, just like playing these characters that you invented. It's so cool. Thank so, you. Um, let me, uh, let thanks. me actually, Cause, cause you, cause you brought that up. Let me talk about that for a split second because that was a fun sure. one to do. So that is my friend Victor and I uh, going through that tunnel. So there was this event at this place called Evermore Park in Utah, and it was called the Convergence, and it was basically a whole bunch of TikTokers that are into fantasy and D and D, and they were kind of, they were the ones who helped me grow on the app and so i'm very thankful for them so victor's one of them so that's both of our pirate characters going through like this creepy dungeon haunted castle <laughs> kind of setup and it was all improvised he is an expert at improvisation like he is so quick on his toes and he is hilarious while he does it so when we would just spend the day going through the park finding different um environments like that and we would just say oh what if and then we yeah, would just yeah. turn on the camera and then we would just go through and just see what happens. <laughs> so that's definitely one of my favorites too. Well, it takes a certain talent to do it. You have that talent. So, Thank um, you. I guess Thank you so much. Add that, 
one more place that you can find Nick is if you go to Beetle House NYC, um, there he'll be, perhaps, <laughs> most likely. And you'll see. And his <laughs> I guess so, if I'm not on um, if I'm not on vacation, then yes, you will find me there. Right. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you once again for joining, and I'd like to thank you for listening, all of you at home or in the car, wherever you're listening to the UBS podcast, where everything, including The Nightmare Before Christmas, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before is a primary source of I hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as Nick and I enjoyed making it. Please share, like, and leave a rating wherever you're listening to it now and follow the show on social media, including YouTube and especially Instagram. Be sure to tune in next week when our topic is Back to the Future Part 2, with guest Dustin Redick. Until then, thanks for listening to the EPS Podcast, where everything is a primary source.